G holla, G dot holla. Shout out to G holla. To G holla. G E holla. G holla. G holla. G E holla. G holla. Oh my God, G holla. Boy, G holla. Shout out to G holla, and also uh, let me holla at you for your one million accomplishments. You are. Uh, Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today I bring to you a wonderful treat, a wonderful honor, a beautiful birthday candle on top of the cake because today is my birthday. You know what I'm saying? I get to have a wonderful divine light that is shining so bright, that is so amazing. You know what I'm saying? Y'all see the Superman curls on the hair. Y'all see it. Y'all see, see the Superman waves in the hair. You know what I'm saying? Just fine and define and refine all at the same time, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, this lady is amazing. I mean, she does everything within the industry. There's some, I don't think there's something she don't do. You know what I'm saying? She might be sweeping one moment. She might be booking clients and, and training them for media. You just don't know. This lady is everywhere being all amazing as she is and what she does. And she then throws up on the screen. Let me see if she's still with me. You know what I'm saying? I'd like to welcome you all back, man. We have a wonderful guest this afternoon, this evening, this morning. Whenever you may tap in and hear it. This interview, this live stream, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about a, a superwoman of, of superwomans, you know what I'm saying? The heroes of heroes, the heroes of sheroes, you know what I'm saying? Good phase, don't, don't fade, nor does it age, you see what I'm saying? And as soon as y'all see her come on to the line, let her know she's right on time and absolutely divine and fire. Please welcome to the show, Francis Perdue. What's happening with you, Francis? How, 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 how are you? Good. I'm doing I had to switch it up and do it from the phone. My computer said, I'm not, I'm not worthy today. It just shut down. <laughs> it said, you're doing too much work. Why are you here, lady? So, yeah. Hey, hey speaking, of, speaking of doing too much work, you know, you work 24-7, 3, 366. You know what I'm saying? You added another day. We don't know how you did it, but you can do it. I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know. I'm now, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, G. Holla, holla, holla. <laughs> <laughs> it is to raise it you once again you are just absolutely wonderful in my book you know what i'm saying oh, oh you check off all the lists check off all the lists you know just got it going on what you're doing you know what i'm saying so i want to talk yeah. a little bit of your story if i may we don't get too much in your business your business but okay. you from, take us back in your story oh i was born and raised in la i'm a compton baby 5535 West Coco Street. So um, I grew up off a of center in a laundry, what site? <laughs> and um, my family pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. My dad was in the Navy. So there used to be an actual Naval Station in Long Beach. So my mom worked the BXPX, the mall for the military where you get all the discounts. And so um, I grew up in Compton. My dad um, moved me to the Inland Empire and um, built a house out in Montclair. And then I spent the rest of my um, childhood and teenage years there. And then I went to UC Riverside after that. And then I moved back home because I miss KJLH. Kindness, joy, love, happiness. By the way, for those who are not natives of Southern California, that's Stevie Wonder Station. So I just came back um, more South and, and had my roots in Long Beach again. Okay, okay. They all can't be California girls. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> It's hard out here, baby. You feel me? Right. Don't, you don't, don't be from Cali. No one of your vibe is like that. You so mad, chill, and cool. You're like an ocean wave. You know what I'm saying? You just flowing <laughs> in, flowing out. You know what I'm saying? Well, I got southern roots. My parents are from Birmingham, where I'm currently at, taking care of my father. But um, definitely had those southern roots. My mom made sure that I said, yes, sir, and no, man. So I, even though I was from Cali, I couldn't get away with some of them Cali kids got away with. I, I just couldn't. <laughs> I'm tired of y'all people from out west and up north act like y'all ain't got no, no, no southern roots. Thank you for saying that. I did, they all southern. Come on, come on, where you started from first. Okay, let's go, let's go, let's right. go. <laughs> no. When you was younger, did you notice that you was really into like marketing, branding, and storytelling? How did those things um, sync with you as a younger person? You're still young, but when you was younger. That's a great question. I actually thought I was going to be a neurosurgeon. And so my dad always drilled it to me. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a doctor, right? So I said, I'm going to be a doctor. However, I want to be, you know, you had to put your own on it. So I said, I'm going to be the seventh black female neurosurgeon you've ever met, right? <laughs> I was a sassy little thing. I'm still sassy, but I digress. And so I ended up um, going into the arts, but 
younger, um, I would say elementary, I would write poetry. I would write stories. I think I got one story poem published or something like that. And my mom kept, I love to write and stuff like that. She didn't miss too much storytelling part, but she said, I love to write. And so when I got to college, I thought I was going to be on the pre-med track. I even got a couple scholarships and that didn't work. I couldn't be- pass bio 5A to save my life. Okay. Couldn't pass that series. So I ended up going into college radio. Um, it had a black day, which was KUCR, so on Sundays. They don't have it anymore, but it was our black day. And so I used to get up way early in the morning, walk to the radio station from my apartment, and I would open the radio station, and I was Miss Nia on 88.3, so on Sundays. That shaped who I started to know, connections with different people. I did um, a lot of community events. I did our Juneteenth celebrations. Um, I learned about the different sororities, fraternities in the areas. I would give away, and I can't say it because I don't know if this is censored, but no, the uh, Q's it. used to have a festival every day, and I would give out the... You said, say it. Say it. Oh, I gave out the big-ass pass every year. <laughs> so, you know, they had all of their events, but I was the one that they said, here's a friend, here's a pass. It's going to give it away to the big booty holes. You know, they was crazy. <laughs> but they partied, but they all a lot to the community and so they would have their fundraisers i would support every aspect of the community um nation of islam fruit of islam they would have different things i would support them so i got a great well-rounded view of networking before i knew what it was and then um some of my brothers were there on the station ended up going to regular radio stations so that's how i kind of got into entertainment and people were like you're the hub so they deem me the hub they like ask Francis she'll know who the person is or how to get something done and so they kept wanting me to manage them so I ended up being a talent manager before actually going into public relations I still manage um a couple of people that I love so one of them is Charnel Brown if you know Kim Reese from a different world her and I have been rocking since 2010 and um I still manage her and her day-to-day stuff but other than that, I, I'm very, very picky on who I um, bring on for talent management. So it's been a journey. Yo, look, I was just about to ask you this question. I swear I could have wrote it down, put it in the envelope, sent it to you. I, I was just about to say, you remind me of the real life, um, different world. What happened to the, the essence of Black people? I understand debt and all that, too. That changed a lot of people's view. But what happened? What do you think? What happened between that early, um, early '90s or late '80s vibe coming off the Cosby shows and stuff like that to a different mm-hmm. world? Because a lot of people within that certain age bracket, they dreamt to go to college, and now people are like, man, I ain't doing none of that. You know what I'm saying? What do you think? What happened? I think that is still there. Um, I don't know if you see this beautiful HBCU movement. Um, mm-hmm. I have a um, best friend that went from our white only white college and went to HU Howard University for her master's degree and I had a lot of people in my life who were HBCU um, students right and graduates so I think that it's still alive it's just now getting that trend back of it being popular of it being cool to learn about your culture learn about yourself in the midst of getting an education because a lot of things you find out is that we've done a lot of stuff first right and so at the end of the day I think that we haven't lost it I think that a lot of people just decided to go wherever they wanted to go to school and we didn't have any continuance of shows that represented us right which is the key to show us the path in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s that that um, College Hill I don't know if you remember I think I don't remember if it was um, Tracy Edmonds or whomever came out with College Hill for BET. Um, we had a couple glimpses of different things, but it never really stayed and never really came into fruition and was like a different world. So we never had anything like a different world again, but we have glimpses of different aspects. And then, you know, culture change, technology definitely changed, right? And so um, I think that we do have it. It's just not as prevalent as it was before. Mm. And isn't Compton also known as the hub city? Am I, am I correct? Am I saying that right? It is. Wow, it look is. at, look at that. And they called you up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so many show. great people in entertainment that came from like the city is not even funny. Yes, it's it's amazing too, because you know Compton is not like big as New York or you know what I'm saying, or even other places that's really big. And a lot of you're right, a lot of great dope original uh revolutionary talent came out, you know, other than you know N- NWAs and things. And the mother people brothers. that you never think of, like the George Bush family, came from Compton. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, 
No, no, keep real. And there's horses there, people. You guys act like we just shoot, shoot, bang, bang them up. No, there's horses and there's actually ranches and everything. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You're absolutely right. I, I love to see the black cowboys. I've seen some black cowboys in Atlanta and it just make you realize, like you said, you spoke of something earlier when you said we, we've done these things first. Even when you break down the word cowboy, you know that we was doing it first because they used to call the boys who wrestled cows boys. You know what I'm saying? So hence, exactly. and even the dude, they, you feel me? the dude they put on TV back in the day for the, for the, for the, for the grandparent generation, the uh, Lone Ranger, they didn't know they was really watching a depiction of this black man named Bass Reeves, who that's all about. You feel what I'm saying? I love it. Yes, Giala. <laughs> Tell them. Get them together. Um, you know me? Hey, I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking to Whitley from a different world right now. You know what I'm saying, girl? <laughs> the wine, the wine. <laughs> when you said that, she was like, "Girl, you don't look nothing like me and my baby." She has gonna be like, "He played too much." <laughs> good things don't pay. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, jump back to your story because you're so dope. You got so much stuff going on. What what transpired from college? Okay, then once you graduated college, because we all know or we don't know, college radio is the it was the wave. It's still the wave to get popping out here in these streets. But I mean, I mean, we were dropping all kinds of hits, right? <laughs> I my biggest thing from college radio is that you remember Tyrese's "How You Gonna Act Like That." Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so this is what people didn't know. So radio um, got all of their stuff from the record labels. They would give it to us six months to a year before we hit regular radio. We were the test dummies, right? Or test subjects, however you want to put it. And so we will report what was right or what we played. So I played How You Gonna Act Like That. He was going to come out with this techno sounding song. And I was like, nah, that's the one. And so I reported it. Then my big brothers, right? So I'll tell them. So A1 with the sauce. A1 went to 92.3, and then KC, his little brother, which was my big brother, right? KC went to um, 991 KGGI. They stole my list. So they went to regular radio ahead of time before us reporting it to the actual radio, not radio, but the um, Capitol Records and whoever he was with, right? And they started playing this song. So I broke how you gonna act like that. So it's just like so dope how college radio can mold all these different people and they end up in different places in entertainment. I actually filmed my first film because somebody needed help scouting. And that's how I actually had my first film experience. I scouted for the locations. I got it approved by um, UC Riverside where I went to college. I'm an alma mater. Um, my alma mater is Highlanders. And so they actually um, gave me approvals to actually go into the black dorm pan-african theme hall and actually record so that was my first experience with television and film and i got paid what? hey that's a yeah. true positive you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. see what the francis Purdue. she getting paid and she connected with her folks man that's amazing yes. you know a lot of us in in this media business we we could connect especially in atlanta you know this of course but you, we could connect with people but we don't mm -hmm. know how to connect payment to the placement, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? To the advancement. What? Give us mm -hmm. some jewels. I know you're going to give us all the secrets. Just give us some jewels. How do we get paid in this media of uh, business? Well, you have to monetize your, your platform. So whether it's Roku, whether it's um, you go ahead and you focus on getting your 1,000 or 10,000 followers for YouTube where you can start getting paid as an aggregator, meaning that you bring in actual content to the actual outlets, that's how you start to get paid. You also wanna monetize through advertisements, right? So think of yourself like a Roku or Tubi. People wanna sign up for free, but if they watch an advertisement, you get paid. And mm -hmm. so by advertising on your own platform, whether it's your website, whether it's through video, television series, whatever you decide to do or podcast, right? You want to make sure that it's distributed and you have an agreement where you get paid per click per impression. Mm -hmm. So that's how you can actually monetize. That's right. That's Some right. people actually charge the people to come on board. I think that that's disingenuous, but everybody has to make a living, so I don't judge. But some podcasters or some interviewers charge for um, interviews as well, which we call payola in music and in um, television and film and public relations. We call it pay. That's right. That's right. 
<laughs> no, no, you're right. I, I, I do the monetized way. You know, I do the pay per click. Whether you use Google, Bing, search engines, things of that nature, uh, find some investors. You know, so I'm, I'm definitely with that. You know, I never charge anybody to come sit down and have a conversation with me, especially in media, because it just seems weird to me. This is my thing. It just seems weird. I'm asking you. To, first, I, I reached out to you, and I'm like, hey, I want you to come on, and then I'm be like, hey, give me a hundred dollars. I don't know. It just seems weird to me. This is my thing. I think just because they, they haven't figured out how to monetize yet. I try not to judge too much, but um, I think it's when you learn how to monetize or you can ask, you know, I think a lot of things too, like the Jasmine brand and other um, Blavities and things like that, they reach out to corporate dollars, right? So they go to the corporate people like Toyota and they say, hey, we have this many subscribers, this many people watching, this many people clicking. Would you like to advertise with us? Then that saves you from going to the actual people you're getting the content from, right? And asking them for money and you get paid more. So if they gave you $5,000, $10,000 to promote for the whole year, who cares if the, your banner ad is popping up every time they go? So because you get paid per click to, then that works. So you can get out here and become an actual entity and really run this thing like a business. That's right. I love that. Thank you for giving the people knowledge and wisdom breakdown. You're also amazing because, you know, we need that. You know, everybody thinks they know everything and then something new comes along and you're like, wow, this is like Christmas. I'm being given a gift and I didn't understand what I was doing and how I was doing it. So that's really dope. And I thank you for doing it. Back into your story, though. You know what I'm saying? This is why we're here today because we're kicking it with Francis Patu. You know what I'm saying? So, Madam Francis. As you're building your network and things of that nature, what is transcribing from there in your life? Take us on this journey, if you don't mind. Oh, so I got to ship up here around pictures. And from there, I end up doing um, teaching. So I was teaching and somebody said to me, why don't you manage me? And I was like, I got to make money. What are you talking about? I got to teach. And so I ended up managing um, one of my friends from college. Um, he goes by Beethoven and Hansi now. Um, and so... That was my first kind of go around with that. And I ended up having different clients. And then one day I ran into this guy by the name of Eric Snowden. If you don't know who Eric Snowden is, he was a writer on In Living Color, all of the Williams Brothers stuff um, that you can think of, right? And everybody else black. And we were at this event that this lady put together um, called Mondays, right? Her name was Cecily. And so I went and one and all of our friends and stuff that I knew from, you know, my internship and other things, we went and I was talking to him. He said, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm a teacher trying to be this. Blah, blah, blah. He was like, girl, next time somebody asks you what you do, you say you're a publicist. Don't say you trying to be anything. And I was like, well, then I'm a publicist. <laughs> and it started from there. And I've had so many clients from NGOs, which are non-governmental org charities for the um for the United Nations, all the way to sports athletes. So I've had every type of client. My preferable client is an actual business or product. That's my hot button. I like getting products out there, whether it be a liqueur or um, a facial product, right? So anything in between those two, that's my hot button. And then businesses obtain um, their branding and experts. So that's like my hot button, but I've had everyone in every facet, even health PR where I've done um, you know, media placement stuff for um, radio, television, for the marketing side, and then also um, interviews and things like that for experts for a health company. Wow, you are dope. How do you become a beta tester? Because I know a lot of times they be having products and services that they want the public to try, things of that nature. Do you, do you have information on that, being on the publicist side of things? Well, I do what's called product placement. So that goes into what you said about beta testing. So we pick influencers and we give them product packages. We give um, journalists and editors product packages, meaning testers of actual products. So then they could talk about it organically or if they would like to do a review of the actual product. So that's how we kind of do that. Um, in terms of actual beta, beta testers, you can sign up for different um different programs you can look it up where you can be an influencer and you don't have you can be a micro influencer is what they call it you don't have to have 10,000 or more followers to qualify but you just have to trade your time out for um a post so it'll be like a sponsored post where you take a picture and you make the product look real nice and then you talk about it and then put it up and they give you the free product okay 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 thank you for that too as well also i'd like to ask because you are a publicist and you do help um 
what some people may refer to as low hanging fruit or people micro uh, influencers or businesses where you may not have, you know, maybe under 20, a thousand followers, things of that nature. Right. With your expertise, your wisdom, your knowledge, um, what can we do as as the smaller people in the bigger in the bigger pond to make ourselves look more professional, to not embarrass you all and things of that nature? Because I'm pretty sure there's always some complaints with the lower, you know, lower low, lower level people. I ain't say it like that, but it's true. But you know, the lower beginning stage of people mm -hmm. versus things and things of that nature. Not saying that they don't have problems and clients don't complain about them. But what can we do um, as independent people to be uh, better at media? Okay, are you talking about in the on the media side, or are you talking about as the clients themselves? Oh, oh I'm sorry, my bad. Excuse me. Let me let me, let me properly formulate that better. Um, okay. Speaking of to the media people who are just excited because you know Atlanta has changed the landscape to where is now we can get to the B list, A list, and sometimes C list uh, people, but we don't always govern and operate ourselves like accordingly mm -hmm. during these media interactions with the talent. What can we do as media people, or what should we be doing as media people to be better? I think I love the fact that um, media people are getting more into technology. That's that's the way to go. Meaning that when you want people to sign up for your interviews, you put a Google form together. That helps us as publicists a lot. It helps us with time and energy and going back and forth with emails, right? Um, when you actually are respectful of the chain of command, I would say, in terms of contacting me, for example, Charnell Brown, right? If you contact me, then I'm going to look at the opportunity and say yay or nay, not going around me to her Instagram or her other social media or trying to find her phone number or email her directly, but, but going through the publicist or the talent manager, right, is a proper chain of command, in my opinion. And when people do that, that's so great to us because, it helps you to get to what you want faster because when you go through the talent, they got so much going on. They're not checking that stuff like that, or they don't even check it at all. Just being honest with you with some of these people you think you're talking to and it ain't them, or it might be a social media manager. So when you think that you're going around the person who said no, or just going around them to actually book, then that's not a good, you know, relationship to build and build the relationships with people. Don't feel like because they didn't give you an A-list or a B-lister that they won't have an A-list or a B-lister. I've had um, one of my first experiences at an MTV gifting suite and they couldn't believe that I was repping the person that I repped. And when he came, then they treated me differently. So, you know, treat people all the same, I would say. And know that one day that one C-lister or D-lister may be an A-lister and they may remember that you were the only one who interviewed them and they give you an exclusive. So treating people the same way with the respect that you want as a media outlet so we don't say, oh, you're not entertainment tonight. We can't interview with you. It goes both ways. So if we have that type of relationship and building a relationship, and sometimes it doesn't hurt to just say, hey, Francis, how you doing? Hey, such and such, how you doing? And just reaching out and building a rapport. They may send you something that you may not have gotten an invite to. Sure, sure. So those would yeah. be my couple of jewels. Well, thank you for those jewels too. Cause you know, we all need it. We need refresher courses. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna speak for myself on that. You are awesome. Okay. The, you know what I'm saying? You know, you, 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 you wanted to, you wanted to, and I say this and I don't say this just to be facetious or to, to, you know, to gaslight or whatever, but yo, let me tell you something for real. You are one of those people's where when you, when you connect with people, you have such a real and warm and a true spirit. You will, you will sit there and organize and break down everything for a person to be able to be successful in this business. And that is amazing because you're going out your way to do the extra stuff to help, you know, uh, the independent media people. I've seen it for myself you know with a recent thing that you set up for us and you know you was just so gracious about it and so dope about it and so like awe and aspiring how you what you did to break it down i'm telling y'all man this lady is amazing and you just made it so so fluid for everybody to connect with you and i personally thank you on that level because you really know what you're doing you're not out here thank just you. doing for the shine you are the light and i just appreciate you oh don't make me cry gee holla holla <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I do my best to make sure that people are treated the way I want to be treated. And sometimes that doesn't, you know, turn into reciprocity per se. But I, I have to admit, I've lived a charmed and blessed life thus far. And I know that my reciprocity is catching up to me every day. Mm -hmm. Yes, man, that synchronicity touch all over you and get and just move in ways and open up doors for you because you really are dope and you really, truly are amazing. Who, who's 
some of the, if you if you can, you know, this is my celebrity life back there. You see it right there, right there. Well, that's that, that's that. Okay, who some celebrities that you connected with, some A listers, B listers, whoever, popular people that you really was like, you really like, and you really was vibe with. Can you tell us that? You said that I was vibe with. Yeah, vibe like on, like on a business level, like you know, what I'm saying like they cool. You like interacting with them. They like you know, what I'm saying like good, good, good vibes, good, good, good business relationship. Is what I'm saying. I'm sorry. No, that's a great question. Um, I would say Charnel Brown. She's been my longest standing client. Um, we just did an event with HBO Max where it says it's more than a month. You can still catch it on probably Twitter spaces. Um, it was her, Kadeem, Jasmine, Cree, um, Don, and Daryl that were on the actual panel with Charnel. And they talked about a different world. So Charnel is one person I vibe with on the business side. We have um, a movie out right now called Changes. I'm a producer on, and I was able to get it distributed through Tubi. And so her and I have had the longest um, relationship. I think I've had a great relationship with all of my clients, per se. Um, Some people that I admire in the business that um, some of my colleagues work with, I would say the one person I really admire, and I know this sounds crazy and random, is Morris Chestnut. I feel like he lives what he puts on the screen for me. Black love is amazing. And so the fact that he's had the same wife, same black wife all this time, and he's on your, he's on um, all of the black love stuff. I love it. And so I feel like he's awesome. Um, I've run across a lot of great people, but I think like him and a couple other key people are like, I'm like, yes, there's hope out there. (laughs) (laughs) So I read into some crazy people too <laughs> that I cannot name, um, but um, they don't live what they say. <laughs> go figure. They go, on, they go on Instagram and start begging, please, I'm scary. <laughs> I'm scared. Please help me. And they got millions of dollars. <laughs> Yo, this, South Central. But I hey, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Like you all, you you all of the of the cleanup crew, and I think a lot of people really don't know what publicists really are, like who you truly are. You make this mm-hmm. industry work. When people are about to get canceled, because you got the cancel. Well, actually, the cancel culture has been here for a very long time. It just it just well, got on. I think I think people don't understand. There's different types of public relations. So mm-hmm. right now they call it social media public relations. You'll have someone that just do your social media. Go figure. A traditional publicist does everything right, but there's a thing called a crisis management publicist. Those are people that clean up like Olivia Pope, okay? (laughs) So I'm not Olivia Pope. I'm going to need you to have some sense about yourself. And I'm going to need you to uh, conduct yourself accordingly. So if you went out here and murdered four people and then you come back to me tomorrow, spin it. I'm going to run the other way for plausible deniability. You understand me? So I'm not that person. So don't come to me talking about yes. So I said, this is my baby mama and it's not. And we had a fake relationship back in 2002. And now I got her mad and her son mad. Don't come to me. I can't do nothing for you. Okay. But if you really (laughs) about your business and you don't believe the hype that good, good and bad press is the same press, then I can help you. If you understand that you can conduct yourself as an adult, then we can be okay. And that's why I deal with products because they don't talk back and they don't go out and cause problems. Okay. As long as okay. the FDA are tested and all that stuff, we good. <laughs> okay. So speaking of that, like, what if they have like a medical recall? You know, a lot of these have these these different um, things that is going on in the medical field. Have you yeah. ever been stuck between that where there was a major recall or something, or, or they were terminating the, a product or service that you know the medical field was offering? Did you, were you ever a part of something like that? Personally, have not, but I did have um, a company I was working with, Nomi Health, and they actually shut down their COVID-19 testing centers that I was over in terms of public relations. And, you know, it was shock to us, but I had just sent them billboards and then they just shut it down. So I think sometimes, especially during like pandemics, it's hard to figure out what's the right locations for, you know, different services. And sometimes it's not necessarily the company's fault. You know, in that case, it just was in rural areas in Alabama. It wasn't in a metro area or close to a metro area to really put an impact. So then when it was time to get press and stuff, it was like kind of pulling teeth. The people who, you know, are 
over the county or whatever communications and government communications is like it was a whole nother world for me because they had lobbyists I didn't even know they had lobbyists for those type of things and so it becomes real complicated when things fail or um, in terms of you know having to close something down or a recall a product recall and all you can do is get the word out as much as possible I think the thing that people are missing though is they're not utilizing social media enough to get these type of recalls and stuff out. Ooh, very powerful. I appreciate you sharing that. You're absolutely dope. That's amazing. Damn. Hmm. So, um, now getting back into your life, uh, currently we'll just skip through some steps, you know. So, what you all in my business? I, 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 I all in your bed, in your bed. So, all what you got right now? Right now, right now. Okay. they say right now. <laughs> okay. So, I will announce it first on your show. I'm stepping down as Director of Public Relations for Homestead Entertainment, and I am starting my new company. It's called Scooter P Entertainment. I am now a Black female-owned distribution company for television and film. You can go to ScooterPEntertainment.com. So, coming soon. So, we will be launching, God willing, March 1st. I'm under the gun but I will be open to people of color who have television, film, and I have an aggregator deal um, going through soon. I cannot say the name of the company, but I will be able to actually produce products now. And then I will have my longstanding contract with Homestead Entertainment. So we will be distributing through Homestead for Tubi, Peacock, and Xfinity Black. Yes, (laughs) Elevation. So, so brilliant. I'm just taking what God gives me and listening to the hunch and going forward. I also um, have started, well, I'll, I'll spill it. So I have an invention that has been in the works for 10 years. It's called Hill It. So Ooh. I am a shorty doo-wop. I'm about five three. I got height envy, okay? My daddy gave me no, he gave me long arms, but he didn't give me no height, okay? He's 6'2", didn't give me nothing. That's him calling right now, but I digress. So I have six inch heels that I always wear, right? If anybody knew me in California, like I'm always stepping. They'd be like, oh, what shoe is that? You know, I, I don't care if it's $20, $5, $50, whatever the shoe is, if I want it, I get it, right? So I ran into an issue that a lot of women run into, and I didn't realize that a little bitty small portion at the end of your heel wears down. And if it's a stiletto, what makes it a stiletto is an actual metal rod. So you ever been at the club and you hear that girl click, clack, and click? Click, click, click. That's because she didn't wore that down, okay? And she need to take them shoes and go get them fixed. You understand what I'm saying? Or put them away and put them to rest, okay? Put it to rest. <laughs> Euthanize the shoe. Okay. So what I did was I created a cylinder where you put the actual heel in it. And it, like a toaster, it goes through different levels and it fixes the heel. So my new product is called Heel It. And I am at the end of my patent process. So I will be, God willing, awarded a utility patent soon. And I found an actual um, manufacturer as well as somebody to um, do the prototyping. So this time next year, I should be rolling out, God willing, my um, product. If I don't get bought out by some major company like Nike or something, where they say, no, you can't can't put this out on the market. I'm like, that'll be a billion dollars, please. Thank you very much. But the goal is to be on Shark Tank, baby. That's on my, my dream board. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm Man, like, I have 1.2 million in sales. <laughs> so which one of you Shark Tank people are going to come with me? <laughs> Let's heal these heels, okay? <laughs> Stop the click clacking that's going on at the club. Hey, you, you, that's, you, that's you feel me? You, you, you know what? I need to, um, I need to connect you with Sean Murdoch because his cousins is one of the FUBU guys. I can't remember which one. I don't know if it's Damon or if the ones that's not on Shark Tank. I need to connect you with them because that'd be dope right there. That'd be real cool for them to I- invest. I appreciate that. See, you're making a dream work. And I give you your 15% for connecting you. You know what I'm <laughs> Gotta 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 bread the butter. So you keep on giving connections. <laughs> Who else do you know? You got more investors. Go on well, tell me because I need that money. You gotta get the product out there. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for having a platform for any and everybody to come on and making us feel like celebrities because we're behind the scenes most of the time, but we're the ones that are the glue and we make those wheels turn, right? We oil them and 
make sure that it's a well-oiled machine and you know we shield you guys from our clients <laughs> sometimes because they'll be like on a different world and you won't ever know it you just be like oh that was so wonderful friend I'm like okay <laughs> but you don't know what happened to get me to get them to there right so we appreciate you as not only just a journalist but definitely a um independent business owner because without you having the dream of wanting your own we wouldn't be here today so i wanted to thank you well no i appreciate that thank you too because you know um i'm glad that you allow for our tables to connect or our, or our business to business to connect because without dope people like you in this business especially in atlanta because you know it's full of black and brown people like this is mm-hmm. our version of hollywood you know mm-hmm. and actually where we had the premiere for first lady three for Dennis Reed's film, um, that's an actual black owned, and I chose it on purpose, it's a black owned membership only club called The Gathering Spot, it, born out of Atlanta. So it started in Atlanta. Now it's moving to Los Angeles and New York and DC and all these other places, right? But it started at the hub. It keep going back Hello? to the essence of who you are. You are the hub, uh, Francis. You, 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 you are the, the, the aqueduct. You, you are the bridge, the tunnel. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Come on now. You are the spaghetti junction. Without you crossing lines and connecting dots, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How great you are. You have an idea, but I understand that's the way that God, the creator, designed it to keep you from really understanding who you are so you can stay grounded with humility and level headed as you are. But you are amazing. You are the yellow brick road, all of that stuff leading us up out of the land of Oz, so to speak. If I may use Oz as far as an analogy or a metaphor or simile or whatever to say that as we're traveling along our journey, we're meeting great people like yourself who have a heart, who have a mind. You see what I'm saying? Who has courage and you're leading us to get up out of the dream state of what we thought wasn't possible. You know what I'm saying? Like Martin Luther King had a dream, but once you get in the dream, you got to wake up at some point and make that dream a reality. And without people like you, all our realities wouldn't be happening right now. So you are mate. I appreciate that. And the re- I'm going to leave you with this too. The reason why I'm doing all of these things, the entertainment company, um, Heal It is because they're witty inventions from God, right? So God rest her soul. My mom, Carolyn Jean Walton Purdue, she will always push me. She just passed away in 2019. And so for me, that was a turning point as an only child. Like, there ain't no more holding off on your dreams. There is no more, you know, waiting on this person to come on board with you. With, without, because of despite anybody, you will make it. Right. So that's how I wrote my first journal, which is Life is in Session. Um, I also got the courage to just continue what God told me to do 10 years ago. And so it's not easy, but God aligns things so you can do what you have to do. And all of this stuff is for a greater good for me. So my my ultimate dream, if I could tell you, Jihala, yes. is to create a social justice endowment for people of color. And with the social justice endowment, what I would like to do is take two lawyers in each state because you have state law and you have federal law, right? And pay for all of their law school, pay for them to set up their own practice. And in exchange for the next five years after they finish um, their schooling, right? They would create what's called landmark cases to create the first, since we haven't done it yet, we don't have an anti-lynching law to this day in 2022 because we allow people to insert um, let me just say, we allow white folks to insert and dismantle what we know we've been fighting for, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so at the end of the day, what I would like to do is have those two lawyers in each state in the United States fighting for legislation to create our first, you know, anti-lynching law. Then from there, after you have a law, you know what comes, Jim Crow era. So that means even though it's law, they can say, well, tonight I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care, right? They're going to do what they want. So in order to press upon them the actual enforcement of the law, you have to have landmark cases, unfortunately, right? That's just the history of our country in the United States of what we have to do. So example, Plessy versus Ferguson of what, 1886 or so, it said separate but equal, was overturned by 1954. So that's about 60 years, right? So in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education overturned segregation as it being legal, and that made it be integration right 
So with that being stated, we have to make landmark cases about these anti-lynching law, right? So we have to make the law stick first, which we still have not done. Then we need to have landmark cases. So I have a bigger dream. I need to make the billions so I can put it back into our people and into our people of color as well, because it's not just black folks being harassed. Let's just be honest with you, right? So it's LGBTQ AI community, it's the Latino community, and even the Asian community got a little bit, especially over this COVID thing, right? Yeah. And so at the end of the day, that's my life's journey. And if somebody gets it before or after I pass, God forbid, right? I'm with it, but we need to do it. Yes, yes. That's thank why you. I'm pushing to make the money. Mm, thank you so much. You are an angel. You are divine on this planet. And I appreciate you. Two more things before I let you go. Just two more things. Okay. One thing is, um, did you enjoy today's interview? Did I hit a lot of topics that you would like to talk about? Yes, I appreciate it. <laughs> an open dialogue. Hey, cool. I'm down with it. And the final thing is, if you could let the people know, I am G Holla, and you're on my slip place. And we'll be about to stay. Okay, what does that say again? Um, I'm on G Holla. <laughs> and on, you're on my life. Life. Okay, so I am on G Holla, and you have entered my celebrity life. Thank you so, so, so much for being the Thank earthly you. divine angel that you are, the heavenly divine creature in your soul and your spirit and your essence. You are definitely the light of the world, the salt of the world. I appreciate mm -hmm. you. And any any um talents you have, I welcome them onto the show too as well if you'd like to send them over. Mm -hmm. um, whoever definitely. else you got, I am down with it. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. We out, y'all. Holla, holla. It's Francis Perdue. And she's holla, so holla. fine. Ooh, she fine. Let's take a look at it one more time. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Hello.